and her daughter-in-law, Nina. So thank you very much for the, all that you have done. I would also like to extend a special welcome to current and former members of the university's board of trustees. If there's any in the audience today, can you please stand so we can recognize you? Maybe online, okay. Um, as well as any administration, including fellow college deans, if you'll please stand and be recognized. I see a couple. <laughs> Thank you all for your ongoing support as well of this lectureship. And so before we get started, just a quick note, we will have a, um, a round of brief questions at the end. So if you can hold your uh, questions to the end, we will moderate that at the very end so that Dr. Elo can answer those questions for you. Um, but we wanna give him the opportunity to share his knowledge first, and then we'll have the questions at the end. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bradley Henson. Um, Dr. Henson served the College of Dental Medicine from the very beginning and started as an uh, assistant dean and then moved on to associate dean for research and biomedical sciences starting in 2011. And during his time at Western U, he has published 23 peer-reviewed articles and dozens of abstracts, and he's presented at multiple national research meetings. Under his leadership, CDM became engaged in the university's greater research enterprise as a result of the expertise, creativity, and initiatives of its research faculty and students. On any given day, one could have observed him engaged in projects and committee assignments. Dr. Henson was everywhere and making it happen. Um, and he it, it cut across not only our college, but all disciplines and lines and curricular blocks. So it is no surprise when he was appointed to the university as interim vice president for research and biotechnology in March 2022. And he held that 
uh, position with distinction for over a year. But today we are excited to congratulate him on his, starting his new role with Western U as Senior Vice Provost. So today he's going to introduce our speaker and I'd like to have, bring him up, Dr. Bradley Henson. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everybody. Um, before I introduce our esteemed speaker, I would like to share some comments from the president, uh, President Robin Farias Eisner, who had hoped to be here today, but uh, was unable. So these are the comments from Dr. Farias Eisner. Greetings, greetings and welcome to those of you joining us on our Western U campuses in Pomona, California and Lebanon, Oregon, or whether you're watching via Zoom. I send my sincere regrets for being unable to attend the lecture in person I am out of the country exploring new and exciting philanthropic and capital development opportunities for the university. I am in Jerusalem at the present time, just having met earlier today with the mayoral team, and I know that uh, Phil would have been excited about these new opportunities for the university. This is the 13th Dr. Phil Pumeran's Distinguished Lectureship and is one of our most important and coveted lectureships. Dr. Pumerantz, our founding president, was extremely passionate and committed to graduate higher education, as, I, as am I. We are thrilled and so grateful for the cons consistently high quality of speakers that the lecture series has attracted for over a decade. We are particularly grateful to this lectureship because the Dr. Philip Pumerantz Distinguished Lectureship in Interprofessional Education is in honor of Western U's founder and President Emeritus, Dr. Philip Pumerantz. However, the lectureship should not be would not be possible without the extraordinarily generous donation from Dr. Elaine Sarkaria and the late Dr. Daljeet Sarkaria of Orange, California. A heartfelt thank you to you. One more round of applause. Thank you. I'm confident that today's lecture will be exceptional. The role of oral and maxillofacial surgery, surgeon on the interdisciplinary medical team will be presented by our very own esteemed Dr. Jeffrey Elo, the doctors Daljeet and Elaine Sarkaria, Professor of Advanced Oral Diagnosis and Therapeutics and Professor within Western U's College of Dental Medicine. Please know that I'll be with you in spirit today and look forward to watching the recorded version. Immense gratitude to all of you here today for continuing to support this highly a clinically impactful lectureship. As you know, for over two years, COVID has forced us all to become experts in teaching, learning, and working in the virtual world. At Western U, though, we've been using a different kind of virtual teaching and learning for decades, with simulated patients such as actors or high-fidelity mannequins to allow our students to practice and master their clinical skills. In 2015, we opened the JNK Virtual Reality Learning Center and hosted virtual reality pioneer, Dr. Paul Brown, as that year's Pumerantz lecture speaker. In 2022, we opened the new Sarkaria Family uh, Patient Simulation Suite. And if anybody, anybody has seen it, it is spectacular. Please, jo please join me in thanking uh, the Sarkaria family for their continued support and all of you for joining today. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Dr. Jeff Elo, for educating us on this exciting topic today. Enjoy the lecture, warmest, warmest regards, Dr. Farias Iser. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I, I just wanna tell you a really quick little story. Um, I've been at multiple institutions and some of them are, are heavy hitters like Michigan and UCLA, and I've known a lot of oral surgeons and a lot of dentists in my life. And people, given my job, people come to me almost on a weekly basis, it seems, and asks me, do you know a good dentist? Do you know a good oral surgeon? And my answer is, I, it's not that I know a good oral surgeon. I know the best oral surgeon. This is not something that you say in front of a crowd like this. Um, just as platitudes for Dr. Elo, this is the truth. He is the best oral maxillofacial surgeon I've ever encountered in my career, and you are in for a real treat today. For this year's Pumerantz Lecture, I'm delighted that we are able to highlight and share the work and expertise of our 
one of our own, Dr. Jeff Lee Elo. Dr. Elo has been with Western U for more than a decade and was promoted to full professor in 2016. Most recently, he was granted the title of the Drs. Daljeet and Elaine Sarkaria Professor of Advanced Oral Diagnosis and Therapeutics. Having a Sarkaria-funded professor deliver a Sarkaria-funded lecture is indeed a special occasion. And it seems like an appropriate time to once again thank the Sarkaria family for their generous support of Western U. And I think you get a, a sense, we're really, really thankful. Um, <laughs> so one more time, please. <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey Elo obtained his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from Indiana University School of Dentistry, completed his specialty residency in oral maxillofacial surgery at Loma Linda University Medical Center, and obtained a Master of Science degree from Loma Linda University School of, of Dentistry. Could you be just a little more ambitious, Dr. Elo? In addition to his faculty appointment with us, Dr. Elo maintains a faculty appointment within the, the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Loma Linda, as well as hospital staff appointments at Loma, Lis Loma Linda University's Medical Center and Children's Hospital. Dr. Jeffrey Elo is a diplomat of and a board examiner for the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. For the American Association of Maxillofacial Surgeons, he serves as a delegate. Uh, he's on the Rules Committee, and he serves as the chair, and he's a member of the Committee on Governmental Affairs. So he's representing Western U on a national and international scale. He's a past president and current treasurer of the California Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons. He's been the editor-in-chief of the California Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery since 2010. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, American College of Dentists, and International College of Dentists. Dr. Elo has authored more than 150 publications, abstracts, poster presentations, and is the author of Oral Surgery for Dental Students, a quick reference guide, and he sees a lot of patients every week. So he, he did all of this in his spare time, I, I know that. Today he will be discussing with us the role of oral and maxillofacial surgeon on the interdisciplinary medical team and sharing some interesting cases. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Elo. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. And, and first, a thank you to Dr. Farias Eisner, Dr. Andrews, and then Dr. Henson uh, for the invitation to be here today. Thank you to Dr. Elaine Sarkaria and Mrs. Nina Sarkaria for, for also uh, your generosity and for being here with us today. It's very nice to meet both of you. Thank you for coming. And then thank all of you for, for being here and thank you to everyone joining us via Zoom. I know it's the end of a busy work day and you're ready to go home and eat dinner. So hopefully I'll make it interesting and, and fun and worth your while. I've titled the presentation, The Role of the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeon on the Interdisciplinary Medical Team and chose this topic because I'm often asked by medical, dental students, other professional colleagues, what exactly does an oral and maxillofacial surgeon do other than take out wisdom teeth on, on teenagers? I said, well, that's a good question. So hopefully we'll provide some information about that today. So my plan is to give a, a brief overview of what oral surgeons are, the training required to become one, and then I'll show some examples of the types of cases that we treat. And then finally, I'll present two patient cases that I hope all of you find interesting. One is a patient with a large lower jaw tumor, and then the other is a patient who underwent reconstructive facial surgery following a bad car accident. Before we begin, I, I do wanna extend thanks again to the Sarkaria family for the generous support of Western U and, and the sponsorship of the event, to the Pumerantz family for Dr. Pumerantz's vision and decades of leadership of Western U, Dr. Farius Eisner and the Board of Trustees, thank you for coming, uh, for the leadership of Western U, Dr. Andrews and the faculty, staff, and students from CDM for your dedication and, and the work that you guys put in every day. And then the other Western U community members who are here and those not here for the excellence and the daily work for the benefit of our students and patients. So let's talk about what is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Well, OMS is, we'll use that abbreviation just for brevity's sake, but they're the only dental specialists recognized by the American Dental Association. 
that are surgically trained in a hospital-based residency program for a minimum of four years. Now, some programs are up to six years. There's one program that's seven years. There's one program that's five years, but at a minimum, there's four-year program. The training focuses on the bone, the skin, and the muscles of the face, mouth, and jaws, in addition to the administration of in-office sedation and anesthesia. And perhaps that's one of the things that makes our practice so unique, bridging that little divide between medicine and dentistry is we're able to sedate our patients. So patients who come in, they're anxious, we have that ability to offer them uh, intravenous deep sedation, general anesthesia in the office setting. OMSs can diagnose and manage a variety of conditions including the aforementioned wisdom teeth removal that, that many of you are familiar with, dental implant placement, extractions of other just not, excuse me, non-restorable teeth, treatment of non-cancerous or benign pathologies and different lesions. There are those fellowship trained in head and neck cancer management who treat malignancies of the head and neck. Treatment of facial injuries and reconstruction. We'll show a, a nice case of that at the end. Surgery to treat obstructive sleep apnea, which is becoming more and more common. We have a, a patient population that is getting larger as they get older, and several of those patients have obstructive sleep apnea, so we're able to offer some treatments to address that. Corrective jaw surgery, when patients' jaws don't line up, we're able to offer procedures to correct that. Treatment of temporomandibular joints. You hear people or commercials, oh, I've got TMJ pain. We're able to help step in as part of a team that manages that. Cleft lip and palate surgery, and then facial cosmetic surgery. Of the 9,000 members of, of oral surgeons uh, who are part of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, there's about 6,500 that are currently in practice with about 2,500 retired members. Well, as I alluded to earlier, oral and maxillofacial surgeon, that's a long title. A lot of people call them oral surgeons, OMSs, oral and facial surgeons, but OMSs we'll use for, for brevity's sake for the presentation today. As I did mention that we, we train extensively on anesthesia. So in those residency programs, we spend five months with medical anesthesia residency doing inpatient or outpatient procedures in the hospital setting. And then we might do anywhere from another 200 to 1,000 or so in office or in clinic uh, sedations of patients before the end of residency training. And that does allow us to get a general anesthesia permit and then uh, sedate patients safely in our, in our clinic settings. Oral and maxillofacial surgeons train alongside medical residents. In addition to medical anesthesia, we train alongside internal medicine, general surgery, where we spend four to five months. Uh, anesthesiology, as I mentioned, five months. And then we also spend some time with ear, nose, and throat, maybe plastic surgery, sometimes cardiology, sometimes neurosurgery, sometimes emergency medicine, just depending on the program. And then OMSs are, a, are an important link in the referral network for dentists and physicians working with orthodontists, general dentists, restorative dentists, and then a whole myriad of different physicians in the, me in the medical hospital setting. What's the pathway to become? Well, undergrad, just as all of you have, have gone through, right? The undergrad education, every degree, uh, you still have to do the pre-dental requisites, right? So I, I studied philosophy and I think I had a minor in Spanish and I, wouldn't really be able to do much with a philosophy degree, unfortunately. So uh, thankfully, I was able to get into dental school. Then after dental school, uh, we go into residency training, the four to six year program, as I mentioned, that's a hospital based program. There's sometimes a dental school component in the clinic, but mainly a hospital based residency. Then there's state licensure. We have to get a dental license. Our anesthesia permits go through that route. Some OMSs complete one to two year fellowships that could be in head and neck cancer, could be craniofacial, cleft lip and palate type patients. Sometimes it's facial cosmetic surgery. There's a different uh, sets of fellowship training uh, programs that are out there. And then some OMS, OMS programs have graduate degrees. So the six year programs offer a medical degree once patients successfully complete medical school. The one program that's seven years also offers a PhD. There's a program or two out in the Northeast that offers a, an MBA as part of the training. And then the majority of OMSs pursue board certification. I think the number is somewhere between 60 and 70% of OMSs pursue board certification. So let's look at some examples of the types of cases managed by OMSs. So just as a disclaimer, the remaining presentation features some images containing uh, graphic surgical content that some viewers, hopefully not, but some viewers may find disturbing. So just viewer discretion is advised. Uh, just as, a, as an interesting note, this was a photo from my residency. I might have been a first or second year resident working with one of my chief residents here. So I found this uh, photo as I was putting things together. Although I think I look fairly similar, except you can't see underneath that surgical hat. There's a little bit less hair. Maybe it's a little bit grayer. Uh, that's, that's present. So one of the things that we do most commonly that most of you, if not all of you are familiar with that oral surgeons do is removal of non-restorable 
and or impacted teeth. And so this is just an example of, of a patient that we might see in clinic on, almost on a daily basis uh, here in the clinic. And this just shows on the, on the top two photos and then the bottom right radiographs just shows non-restorable dentition due to someone with severe periodontal disease. There's just a lot of bone loss. The teeth are really loose and they're not very functional for this particular patient. The bottom left radiograph is showing a patient that has impacted lower molars. So wisdom teeth are the very back teeth on the bottom. And then the second molars, the teeth in front are also impacted. And this particular uh, x-ray was from someone that was one of our, uh, I believe staff here a few years back. Surgical exposure of impacted teeth to facilitate orthodontic treatment and tooth eruption. So sometimes with kids, they have teeth that just are stubborn. They don't wanna come into the mouth. And so we work with an orthodontist as in collaboration with them to do a surgical procedure to bond an orthodontic bracket. And so this is an example of that. The photo on the left is this is a child about eight years old or so who's undergoing just an in-office sedation. You can see a little nasal cannula on the outside of their nose. And this just shows a tooth that's not exposed to the mouth that we surgically expose, bond a gold button to it. And off that gold button, there's a little chain. We tie a little tie to secure that chain to the orthodontic arch wire. And then the orthodontist slowly pulls that chain down about one link per month. And then eventually that tooth comes into the mouth. And so this is one way that we collaborate with, with an orthodontist. Other conditions we might manage involve a biopsy or removal uh, completely of pathologic lesions of the oral cavity in the face. So most uh, oral surgeons will manage benign oral and facial pathology. But there are also fellowship trained OMSs who work in conjunction with, with hospital-based oncology teams to manage malignancies. So these are just a couple of examples of patients that we saw here in clinic. The photo on the left is showing a right ventrolateral tongue squamous cell carcinoma. So those of you in your OMFP course, you, you can identify something like this, looks pretty, uh, pretty bad. And so we would do a biopsy first. We're certainly not gonna try to do an excision of a lesion that looks like this, but we'll take a sample, send it to an oral a maxillofacial pathologist, get a diagnosis, and then based on the diagnosis, we figure out the best uh, appropriate management. The middle photo just shows a squamous papilloma, very common soft tissue lesion of the skin of the lower lip. And so those are ones that we can just simply excise. And then we also do some procedures where we might remove a lesion or a mole or some pigmented lesion on the, on the patient's uh, skin. This is another case of a patient that came through clinic, but there's other conditions called dysplasia. They're precancerous, but we don't want to forget about them because sometimes they follow this spectrum of progression where they start with a mild, then become moderate, then become severe, and then they become a carcinoma. And so we want to get to them early if they become moderate or severe. And this particular patient was a little older gentleman here in the clinic and that he had uh, severe epithelial dysplasia on biopsy. So we planned on doing an excision of it. So you can see the progression of the case in the top left photo. You see just the extent of the white lesion, pretty good size, just where the red highlighter is outlining. It actually wraps a little bit over the top of the crest of the ridge, but you can then see the patient comes in. We numb them up just under local anesthesia, take a little marking pen and outline where our excision is going to be. These are lesions that don't necessarily invade periosteum, the layer that's intimately attached to the bone. So we can do a supraperiosteal dissection. You can see that lesion is now excised completely with about a seven millimeter margin. It scallops a little bit in between the teeth. And then for this one, I wanted to do an immediate reconstruction. Otherwise you can appreciate this might just be a big ulcer. Think of the, the biggest cheek bite or the tongue bite that you have and, and multiply that by a lot. This would be a big wound that would have to heal. So we put this resorbable porcine collagen matrix and this is made from a company called Geislick and it's named Mucograph, but we can see just a lot of the suturing that we'll just put into that to secure it in position. And then after only about a month and a half, two months, you can see a nicely healed. Now this person's not necessarily out of the woods. We put them on a, on a follow-up basis to make sure there's no recurrence of any dysplasia. Other things that we do when we work in conjunction with our dental faculty or outside dentist or prosthodontist, bless you, is that we'll do pre-prosthetic surgery that helps prepare patients to receive either dentures or dental implants. So when we see a patient like this, which is a commonly seen in our clinic, maybe not to this extent, but we call these palatal tori. It's just normal bone, maybe growing abnormally. And so these are things that if we try to put a denture on top of that, the denture is going to be really big, bulky. It won't really sit up in, inside the palate with a good seal. So these are uh, items that have to be removed. Normally for palatal tori, I usually just take the patients to the hospital operating room. Very difficult to try to do a procedure like this, either under local anesthesia or even 
sedation in the clinic because we have to pull the tongue back so far and we don't want to obstruct their breathing or anything like that if they're sedated. The middle image shows the same thing, but now with the mandible. So on the tongue side of the lower jaw, people can have what's called mandibular lingual tori. And these can be small, medium, large. These are probably on the, on the medium to large size. But similarly, if we're gonna put a partial denture or a complete denture in a patient like this, the, the flange of the denture or the saddle of the denture has to go all the way over these bony bumps. Now there's no space for the tongue. And so removal of these facilitates a patient being able to get a partial or a complete denture. And then we, these are things that we see very commonly in our clinic. Also, other bony growths can be on the palate side in the back. Just like we get tori on the inside, you can get these lateral palatal exostoses, which occur a little bit on the roof of the mouth, but maybe on those little palatal shelves. And so we have to remove those also to allow a better fitting denture. The bottom row of images is really the continuity of a case. And so this was a patient who was just sick and tired of wearing a denture that really didn't fit very well. If you look close, it's a little bit tough, but I'll, I'll highlight some things in the photo. This would be across the crest of the ridge. So this pink area here, this is all the palette pulled back. It's just a little retractor. This is, only, uh, this is only the amount of bone that remains. This is the anterior nasal spine, right where the highlighter is. This is the left floor of the nose. This is the right floor of the nose. So you can imagine there's just no bone. It's not much thicker than a hard boiled eggshell. So when a person puts the denture in, the denture falls right out. They fill it up with a lot of adhesive. Maybe it stays, maybe it doesn't. And so the patient was just really sick and tired of the denture and wanted to undergo bone grafting for it. So this patient, we chose to do bilateral hip grafts to, to harvest our bone. We can see just blocks of bone secured in position with some screws. There's even a titanium mesh that we form a little crib, put some marrow into that crib, but just block grafts are placed all across the upper jaw. Then you can see after about eight months of healing, we go back in and there's a whole bunch of screws we have to take out and then put the implants in at that time. And then those have to heal for about six, seven months. And then at, we're finally at the point where the patient can have the implants restored. Other things I mentioned moments ago is that OMSs are part of craniofacial teams. And so in that capacity, we're, we work in hospital systems that have craniofacial teams. Those might consist of a pediatrician, plastic surgeon, ear, nose, and throat doctors, neurosurgeons, speech pathologists, social workers, many others that are part of these teams. And so this is a patient that had what we call a persistent oral nasal fistula, but still had a cleft of the alveolar ridge. So typically patients who have a cleft lip and palate, not only do they have a cleft of the lip, they have a cleft of the palate, but they also have a cleft of the alveolar ridge, which is the tooth bearing portion of the jaw. So this patient's around the time of where their permanent canine has about half to two thirds of the root formed, but they still have this vertical cleft, goes all the way up into the floor of the nose. So when they drink fluid, the fluid can still go up into the nose and come out of the nose. Very odd, right? Very uncomfortable comfortable for a child or anybody for that matter. And so around this time is when we plan to do their bone grafting. So similarly, the patients take it to the operating room. These aren't necessarily office-based procedures, but we make our incision outline with a little marking pen. I work with residents, so we draw a lot of uh, lines where we're going to make our incisions for teaching purposes, but you can see the outline goes there. The reason it goes up onto the palate in addition on the facial surface is because that fistula, it's like an infolding of the gum tissue goes all the way up into the floor of the nose. So we have to excise that whole soft tissue communication all the way into the nose. And once we do that, it looks something like this. So this would be that palatal gum tissue here. This is the lip side gum tissue. There was a little supernumerary tooth. That's what was removed. You can see just that silver crown is the same as silver crown just for orientation. But once we get that fistula closed and we invaginate that nasal floor, we have to suture that closed and push it back up into the nasal floor. And then once we've done that, we're able to put bone graft material because we still have a bony gap we have to bridge. And in this patient and most of our patients, we just take bone from their hip. And then this is what it looks like upon suture closure. And then a couple of months later, the nice thing about kids is they heal so beautifully. And so this child did no different, which is great. Another component of our practice is sometimes we manage other complications. Sometimes they're complications we cause, sometimes they're complications other people cause. This was a patient who was referred to me from one of our former Loma Linda residents who's actually up in practice in Canada. And he was uh, seeing this patient as a referral from one of his dental offices that he works with. And as you can see in the radiograph in the middle, they, they took out a top left wisdom tooth. So that was successfully removed. They took out a bottom left wisdom tooth, no problems. They took out a bottom right wisdom tooth, no problems. But the top right wisdom tooth seems to have escaped. 
And so that was one that they lost visibility on. They take a two-dimensional X-ray, which is like what this is, and that tooth could either be in the maxillary sinus or possibly in the infratemporal fossa. Well, if it's in the sinus, not that big of a deal. If it's in the infratemporal fossa, could be. And so he ended up stopping, which was good, got a CT. And on the CT, what we show, these are just three-dimensional reconstructive images. But you can see this is where the socket would be for the wisdom tooth, and the tooth just got pushed a little bit higher and a little bit farther back into the infratemporal fossa. Now the maxillary artery goes in that space. That's roughly the diameter of maybe your index finger. So if you hit that in your office and it starts bleeding, you're in big trouble. And the patient's in bigger trouble because it's gonna be extremely difficult to stop that bleeding. Uh, this particular patient, they flew down and we, we took the patient to the operating room where we were ready just in case we needed blood products or anything to really stop bleeding, even with interventional radiology. But one of the biggest complaints the patient had was they couldn't open their mouth beyond maybe about a finger width. And the reason for that was that tooth was wedged just behind the cheekbone. And then there's this little shark fin portion of the lower jaw called the coronoid that when they open the jaw, the coronoid pushes that right up against the back of that tooth and they're just mechanically locked shut. And so that's the worry of trying to sedate a patient like that in your office in addition to the bleeding risk. So we take them to the operating room and take that out. Other things that OMSs might do is treat benign jaw cysts or recognition of some syndromes. And so the, the two images on the left side here, the top one and the bottom one, this was from the same patient. It's an 11 year follow-up. So this patient had what's called an orthokeratinized odontogenic keratocyst, which behaves a little bit differently. It looks differently histologically and it behaves a little bit differently clinically than a uh, parakeratinized excuse me, odontogenic keratocyst. So they're less likely to recur. The linings may be a little bit firmer, but they also respond to a procedure that we call marsupialization and decompression. And the way that I describe that to patients is think of a water balloon hooked up to a dripping faucet. It's just dripping, dripping, dripping. The bag or the balloon is growing, growing, growing. And then at some point you put a little pinhole through that. So it's still dripping, but it's also draining. And then as it drains, the body lays down bone on the periphery and it shrinks the cyst really naturally. So the oral surgeon's role is to just know that this procedure exists, educate the patient on how to irrigate through that drain and then just be patient. And then as, after about 11 months, the whole cyst thankfully went completely away. We just had to do a small little removal procedure of where the drain was. But for the most part, she got complete resolution of that just by using the marsupialization and decompression. And then this is an 11 year follow-up. So this is a patient that we see year after year to make sure there's no recurrence. But you can see even with all the root resorption that the cyst had caused from the beginning, we didn't have to do any root canal. So I know sometimes it goes against what our uh, root canal faculty, endo faculty. Sorry, don't, I know. Uh, but then there's also, so the teeth don't test vital to pulp testing, but they still have the, the blood supply that goes into them. So that's why, thankfully, in my mind, that's why the teeth remain all these years later, even though they have no root and don't test vital. Dentigerous cysts, this is something that we might commonly see in younger patients, just these impacted uh, teeth that aren't erupted into the mouth, have these single unilocular lucencies. So pretty common lesion that we see among kids. And then one of the things that I think is pretty neat about dentistry or OMS is sometimes patients can have multiple jaw cysts, and that should trigger us to be thinking about some syndromes that can present with that. And this was an eight-year-old patient with the Gorlin syndrome or the nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. And so for the OMFP course graduates here, you know that there's multiple findings that we have to be worried about. The name of, of the condition, the nevoid basal cell carcinoma being one of them. So they get a whole bunch of basal cell carcinomas, uh, but there's other issues that go along with that uh, particular condition. Corrective jaw surgery, as I mentioned earlier, this was a patient that just wasn't happy with their, their bite. They weren't happy with their function or the aesthetics. You can see there's a little bit of a cant. If you look at the photo on the left side, you can see there's just some asymmetry in the patient's jaw. The right side's a bit longer than the left side. Sometimes it's just a growth anomaly. Sometimes there's a traumatic event that took place when the, when the patient's younger and it disrupted the growth. And other times it's a habit. Some people can have tongue thrust habits or they suck their thumb or some other type of a habit that can alter the, the growth of the upper and lower jaw. This particular patient, I don't honestly remember what was the growth uh, disturbance. Maybe it was just something that naturally occurred, but you can see just the bite is a little bit off from where we would like it. The, the upper teeth are sitting inside the lower teeth. We call that a cross bite. 
And you can see the there's asymmetry, the upper and lower jaws don't line up in the middle, but you can certainly appreciate an occlusal cant. So this was a patient, the way we do orthognathic surgery is we'll get a, a medical CT on the patients. We'll do a virtual planning. We'll figure out where do we wanna make our cuts? How much do we wanna alter certain positions of the jaw? This one had quite a bit of work. We had to do upper jaw surgery, lower jaw surgery, uh, alter the position of the chin, but then we also placed a big uh, portion of, of hip bone graft to the right angle to try to lengthen that side of the face. And so you can see, I think we got them close. I'd like to soften this a little bit if I'm being honest, but from where we started and where we finished, uh, patient's happy, so we have to be happy. You never really want to point out the things that you're not happy with or the patients are happy, right? So that's maybe a take-home message. But we were also able to correct the, the occlusion, which I think was uh, another uh, win for this patient. This is a trauma. I really enjoy trauma and I really enjoy pathology. So this particular patient was a 22 year old male. He was attacked by his, his pit bull. Sometimes if you mess with the dogs when they're eating their food, even if they're your, your friend and they like to lick your face, sometimes they'll bite your face. And so you got to just be careful with that. But this was one that was attacked by his pit bull and he sustained a partial avulsion of skin and cartilage to the right ear or right auricle. And so you can see the defect that's left on the, on the second picture. I just included this photo in the middle just to remind everybody of the names of the components of the ear because we'll use those in just a moment. But what we do to help reconstruct that, because sometimes that cartilage that gets bitten off, sometimes we have it. Other times it's in the dog's stomach and we're not going to retrieve it. And other times it's just lost, like we just can't get it. So this one, we just didn't have it. I don't remember if the dog ate it or if it was uh, like, you know, the dog ain't eat the homework and sometimes they'll eat the ear. So that, that was one of those things that happened in this case. So we use cartilage from the good side at a, at a portion of the ear that wasn't going to leave a cosmetic or functional defect. So to help reconstruct that helix, the outer rim of the ear, we took a cartilage graft from the left ear and then suture that. We have to debride the wound margins because a dog bite can be dirty and have different bacteria and stuff. So we debride that with a drill. I mean, we basically take a round burr and just debride that. No different than polishing off a denture or something like that. We'll debride that, that, that skin on the wound margin, suture in that cartilage, but we have to cover that up. If you leave cartilage exposed, it dies. It doesn't have any blood supply. And so it just becomes a, a dead piece of cartilage. So how do we cover that up? Well, we create a tissue pocket. So this procedure I think was described in the early 70s by a doctor with the last name of M. Lattic. So it was always called the M. Lattic procedure, but others might call it a subcutaneous postericular pocket. And you can see why M. Lattic is a little bit easier. So what we do is we create a pocket. This is done in the operating room, but we, we create a pocket postericularly and we just go with subcutaneous. We just make a dissection. After we've sutured on the cartilage to recreate the helix, we then have this pocket that covers over that. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get skin that covers the front part of that cartilage as well as the side part of the cartilage, knowing that the back part we really can't get to yet. And so that's our phase one is that postericular pocket. That has to heal for a period of maybe about six to eight weeks, something like that. So this is a six week post auricular flap takedown, the top, middle and bottom. This is what it looks like at phase two of the procedures. So we've got skin that is healed on the front, skin that is healed on the, on the side, but we have to figure out a way to tuck that skin on the back part of the graft. Otherwise we're gonna have exposed cartilage again. So we create pocket number two, and that is a new postericular flap to cover. And that's gonna help create that scapha, that indentation on the outside of the helix, and then the anti-helical fold. And so that's the way that it heals then after about another six to seven weeks. And you can see we're able to recreate the outer and then a little portion of the inner, and they get a little bit of scarring in the back, but most people most people have hair back there that they can cover it up. And so that's, that's an acceptable result. Okay, so we've got the last two cases, and, and hopefully you guys will find these interesting. The first one we're going to show is a virtual surgical planning for a mandibular tumor removal and then immediate reconstruction. So this is going to be a resection of a right mandibular ameloblastoma with primary reconstruction using a costochondral or a rib, a rib and then anterior iliac crest or a hip bone graft. So this is a 72 year old female with a right mandibular swelling and then facial asymmetry. And she presented to our oral and maxillofacial pathologist. She was referred then to us or to me for a biopsy and management. And then the biopsy diagnosed as a follicular ameloblastoma. And so you can see on her radiograph, just a pretty large multilocular. So just got almost a bubbly looking appearance to it. 
uh, expansile causing this swelling on a cheek. And that is really affecting the right body, this part of the jaw, the angle, this part of the jaw, the ramus, this part of the jaw, the coronoid, that little shark fin portion of the jaw, and then the subcondylar region all the way up into here. So how do we work these patients up? Well, again, we get a medical CT scan, different than the dental cone beam, because we just have to get a little bit more features than maybe our machines are able to give us. So that includes the maxillofacial and the mandibular areas. Then we set up a virtual surgical planning uh, session, and that's gonna be with a biomedical engineer from the planned plating company. In this case, I use the company KLS Martin, and that really pre-performs the procedure. So I'm sitting at a computer, they're sitting many states away at their computer, and we're designing what we want to do. We have to outline the, the extent of the lesion, tell them how much of a margin we wanna have, make our cuts. So we're pre-performing the procedure. Once we pre-perform the procedure, that allows us to fabricate a custom resection guide that tells us exactly where I, we want to make the cuts. So where I make the cut on the computer screen is where I want to make the cut once I get to the, the patient to the operating room. Then we can fa fabricate a custom reconstruction plate. Otherwise, I got to sit there and try to bend a big old, what looks like a bicycle chain, trying to bend it to fit the contour of the jaw. That can be very difficult and time consuming. So we try to do that all with a custom titanium plate, saves us a few hours of operating room time. And we also plan immediate reconstruction of the condyle with an autogenous, meaning from that patient, costochondral, meaning rib, a graft, and then immediate reconstruction of the ramus, angle, and body with autogenous il iliac crest bone graft, her hip. So what are the concepts? What are some important things about virtual surgical planning? Well, it does help optimize our ability to prepare for and then mitigate potential struggles in the operating room, or, or OR, when presented with complex skeletal reconstruction. It helps makes our time in the operating room much more efficient. We can save all this time from having to, to figure out, well, do I make the cut here? Oh, I don't know. Is this a centimeter margin? Do I have only five millimeter? So it can really cut down on some of the time. Helps minimize the duration of general anesthesia for the patient. I mean, if I'm a patient, I don't think I want to be sleeping under anesthesia unnecessarily if I don't have to be. Uh, so we can save several hours on that. And then it helps minimize operating room costs. And, and I saw a statistic that was listed in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said average cost of OR time in California hospitals in 2020 was about $37 per minute. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but these surgeries sometimes are 10 to 12 hours. And so that can, that can add up uh, quite a bit. What's the process? Well, we start with that CT imaging in the face with specific guidelines. We want very thin cuts. We want the most detail that we can squeeze out of that CT as, as possible. So sometimes in an emergency, in the emergency room, they'll take a quick CT scan. The cuts could be five, seven millimeters in thickness. When we're doing this, we want to get maybe 0.5 or up to one millimeter maybe in thickness, but certainly no thicker than that. And that ensures the most accurate data is available for planning. We have that pre-op planning session that's done via the web meeting. The biomedical engineer, they're just brilliant how they know this stuff. I mean, honestly, I'm blown away every time I work with them. And that's the, gonna be from the company that is gonna be making our, our custom materials. So either a titanium reconstruction plate, the cutting guides uh, for that particular case. I always get, try to get a virtual three-dimensional model. Uh, and, and then we also get a hard print of the three-dimensional model. And you'll see why uh, as we go through. Uh, then the virtual planning software allows manipulation of the data set, and that enables us to design these desired bone cuts or osteotomies, or if we have to reduce somewhere precisely. Custom cutting guides are nice. They, they only fit the, the jaw one way. We can secure them in position so they don't move, and then we make our cuts to, to remove the tumor uh, at, a, at a very precise location. So this is what the planning session looks like. When we're sitting on, on one end of the computer, they're working on the other end, we're able to highlight based on the CT scan data, where exactly is the jaw tumor? Well, based on the behavior of this particular lesion, we know we want to try to get around maybe eight, nine, 10 millimeters of a margin all the way around. Well, if we take that much of a margin of bone all the way around, we're gonna get into some structures that we just can't leave behind, right? We don't have a centimeter of bone at the inferior border of the mandible, it's just too thin. So we can't really take a centimeter. There's not a centimeter to take. The jaw joint bone is called the condyle. If we try to go up into a centimeter, we leave just a little nub and we don't really have even enough bone to put a screw in if we're gonna put a custom plate on there. So these are things that we have to consider. And then the anterior extent of the tumor ends probably around here. And so we have to take about a centimeter of, of margin. So the area in red demonstrates the extent of the bone destruction caused by this particular lesion. The other benefit is virtual surgical planning allows us to use a mirror image. We can use the unaffected side to help 
help us design what we want the final affected side to look like. And that allows us to provide symmetry for the patient. And then this is where we're able to, to use this. As you can see, the green is the, the unaffected left side used as a mirror image uh, to now reconstruct the right side. So now that all that virtual planning has been done, the patient's taken to the operating room. We have our plan ahead of us. We're gonna have um, a, really almost two teams working, someone starting on the face while we're starting getting our rib and our hip. And so this is getting the hip graft taken out. You can see the patient taking a surgery. I try to put some labels just to give everybody some orientation. I know for, for most of you, you haven't seen this. So I'll try to give uh, some orientation to what we got. Patients laying fully flat in the operating table. Their head is gonna be somewhere over here. Their right side is over here, left side's over here. This is the left inframammary crease and then the patient's abdomen. And so just to give you some orientation there. So we make a, we put some local anesthesia, use a marking pen to outline where our incision is gonna be. And then we get started, make an incision dissection through skin. Then there's some subcutaneous tissue. Then there's some muscle, but we're trying to get down then to the rib, which is what we see here. Once we get to that level, and we're trying to be very meticulous because on the other side of the, of the rib is what? Lung. So we don't want to get into that. Otherwise, we have uh, a little bit more than we bargained for in this particular case. So it's a gentle subperiosteal dissection. And then once we're down to the rib, which is this is the rib right here. Once harvested, the rib graft is delicately contoured. You can see how skinny it is. Look how thin that rib is. Uh, we can pinch it almost together. It's a very thin piece of bone, but it does have this nice cartilage cap. And we're gonna keep that cartilage cap to articulate up in our, in our glenoid fossa. And we want cartilage there so we don't have bone on bone potentially, and then run the risk of ankylosis. So we keep about a three millimeter cartilage cap. This is just zooming in on that portion to show what the cartilage cap on that rib looks like. Once the rib graft is harvested, the patient's then taken off, uh, temporarily taken off mechanical ventilation by the anesthesiologist to check for a pneumothorax. Even though I don't think we perforated the, the pleural lining, we have to make sure, right? You don't wanna go based on what we think we did, we have to go on what we did. So we, we take the patient off of mechanical ventilation, ask the anesthesiologist, or we'll fill that site up with, with saline, as you can see there, a little puddle right there in the chest. And then they squeeze the bag. And if there's, if there's a, a plural injury, uh, there'll be bubbles in that saline. And that would indicate that there's a, a pneumothorax that requires further treatment. No bubbles equals negative. Now we can suction out that irrigation and then close it up in layers. Next, after we do the rib, we then go to the hip. And so we're gonna use on this patient, the left medial anterior iliac crest bone graft. If you, if you feel on your own hips, that pointy portion in the front, that's called the anterior superior iliac spine. And then about a centimeter or two behind that is where we start our incision. We wanna leave that spine alone. We just go a little bit farther behind that. The hip bone is fairly wide. We just usually take about half the thickness of it. And then we try to get as large of a piece as we can. I could tell you orthopedic surgeons take a lot bigger piece than we do, but uh, we're still a little cautious on, on not wanting to break their hip. But you can see that bone is really a, a good size. And so you can still harvest a nice size piece of bone. We'll use a combination of drills to, to make our outline osteotomies. And then we use chisels to free up that segment. And then we use curettes to scoop out bone marrow. We also have uh, to access the mandible now, right? We've got our grafts that are going to be har that have been harvested. Now we're working on the face, and so just as we do in, in all of our teaching cases, we draw an outline of approximately what the mandible would look like. We draw an outline of approximately what the tumor would look like, but we don't make our incision right over the bone. It's got to go a decent amount below that because there's the marginal mandibular nerve in that area, and that could. If we cut that, you can't smile, you can't pucker your lips or, or blow your, your lips out like that. So we have to make sure we don't uh, damage any facial nerves. So how do we do that? Well, one, we just have to know the anatomy. Two, that we have to use a nerve stimulator and that's what this shows. So we have a little uh, probe that's placed into the sternocleidomastoid. And then we have uh, our nerve stimulator that as we go through layers, uh, one layer at a time, we test it. And then if there's no twitching of the lip, then we can use a cautery and cut through that. Once we get into the area that we think we might be close, we have to sometimes push things out of the way to make sure we preserve all of the nerve. And then once we've gotten to the area where the bone and the tumor is, you can see the amount of bone destruction, the bony expansion at the inferior border, but all this destruction that had taken place on that particular lesion. Now we've got the mandible exposed. We have to use that resection guide that we made during the virtual planning session. So like I mentioned, it only fits the jaw one way, which is good because you don't want it to be like, I think it goes like this, but maybe it goes like this. So it only fits one way. 
once we got it where we know that, trust me, that, that has happened in the past, but not with these customer section guides, it eliminates all that. So once we get it to that point, you can see there's two rows of holes. There's, there's holes on the bottom and then these holes on the top. Now we're gonna use for the resection guide to keep it in place, we're gonna drill holes on the bottom and put some screws in there to fix that to the mandible. That way it doesn't move. As we start to cut, there's gonna be a saw as you'll see in a moment. That thing vibrates a lot. We don't want things to be jiggling around. So we fix that to the mandible so it doesn't move. You can see there's a vertical slot that our saw is gonna go through. The top ones, we just drill the holes. That's where our final reconstruction plate's gonna go. So it's one way that we can use to line up our holes when we get ready to put our reconstruction plate on. So it's, it's a very smart design. I didn't come up with that, I wish I did, boy. But it, it's a smart design as a fail safe. So we drill the holes now, then when we take off the custom resection guide, we put our plate on, boom, it, we're right there, we're ready to put the screws in. So it's a real smart design. Once that resection guide is secured, and you can see the, the screws are on the, on the bottom holes, maybe not that one, but at least on these, and then we've already just drilled those holes, just no screw, but just drill the holes. Now we have our reciprocating saw, that's what this is. That's gonna go straight then through this vertical slot. Now we put this metal retractor on the medial on the inside of that so we don't cut through. The other side is alveolar mucosa, and then on the other side of that is, is mouth. So we don't wanna be cutting into that. Uh, and so we've got our metal retractor to protect all that tissue. And then we have our Minnesota to, to make sure we don't cut the, the skin of the face and that, that we're just making our vertical osteotomy. This is now the specimen that's been obtained. We can see the lateral view is this one. Then the medial view is this one. And for the most part, the outline looks pretty similar to what we hoped it would look like when we did our virtual planning. I mentioned moments ago that I like to get a 3D printed model. And the reason for that is sometimes the vertical dimension can be a little tough to tell. And we're gonna be putting a rib graft in the position where the condyle was. We have a custom titanium plate made, but the titanium plate doesn't go all the way up into the condyle. We have to put the rib there. And so I have to know, that's the one little area of play that I have to know exactly how high is that ramus. So by having a 3D printed um, mandible, I'm able to measure from the bottom of the plate, essentially, all the way to the top of where the, the top of the rib graph should be. And then that allows me to fix the uh, screw through this plate. Here's the plate, here's a screw to the rib. And now I know exactly that my height is correct based on my 3D printed model. With the rib graph secured to the reconstruction plate, I then make sure we place the cartilage cap that was on that rib graft all the way up against the, the little piece of cartilage that's in your jaw joint in that glenoid fossa, the articular disc. And you can see a little bit of that yellowish, whitish uh, area. That's the disc that's up in the jaw joint. So we've kind of dissected all the way up underneath, all the way up to that level of where the articular disc is there. And then linear markers, here's another fail safe. So we've already got the holes that line up with our resection cutting guide, but see this other black mark that's on the plate. That should line up then with the end of the mandible. So we've got a couple of markers there to say, yes, you're in the right spot. It just makes us all feel a little better that we're on the right path. Especially these procedures, they can be 10, 12 hours long. We gotta make sure everything is precise. and. And, uh, and this always helps. Once the reconstruction plate then is fixed to the mandible, so secured with screws, then we use uh, resorbable collagen membranes. You can see those uh, highlighted by the arrows there. Those are placed on that medial surface because now we're gonna start putting some bone graft, the bone that we harvested from the, from the hip. We're gonna put a block in there and secure that with screws. That's what this is. That's the chunk of bone that's secured with screws. But as you'll see in the next photo, there's also marrow. Marrow is a little bit gritty and, and it can have some sharp edges. And so the, the membranes are put there to make sure we don't perforate through that tissue that then punctures into the mouth. If it punctures into the mouth, saliva contaminates your graft and that could be the end of your graft. And so you go through all that trouble patient wise and, and doctor wise to harvest the graft. We wanna make sure we try to protect it every way we can. So we take that marrow, we have what's called a bone mill. It's like a little uh, blender, think of it that way. That blends up the bone graft and then we use the word morselize. It just chops it up into small pieces. So we have a mixture of autogenous. So from that patient, cortical and then cancellous uh, bone from the hip. And we mix that just for volume expansion. We, miss, we mix it with cadaver particulate bone. And then we also add some avatine, which is like a hemostatic agent to try to soak up any little bit of oozing that could be in the wound. And then that fills up that volumetric void. So you can see all these little particles, any one of them could be sharp enough to puncture through if we didn't reinforce the thickness of that tissue. So that's the benefit of the membrane. Then we've got to take some post-op x-rays. So we did all this procedure, but we got to show 
that the patient didn't hop off of her chair and break her hip or, or blame us for breaking the hip. So we take post-op uh, uh, anterior posterior pelvic x-rays to make sure that there's no fracture of the hip. Of course, if there is, we got to treat it appropriately or get orthopedic surgery to help us with it, but thankfully there's none. Post-op panos on these are tough because there's a lot of artifact, as you can imagine, from the, from the middle. And then we take a post-op chest x-ray. Even though we clinically confirmed the absence of a pneumothorax, we also have to radiographically. Medical legal is not a bad idea to just make sure there's no pneumothorax. And then this is the patient pre-op, the occlusion at about two months post-op, and then, then her clinical photo um, uh, two months later. So she looks happy. There was a period of time she probably wasn't all that happy, but then she became happy again, so that was good. Okay, last case. So now we have uh, a revision facial trauma surgery, and this one's going to involve using intraoperative navigation, computer-assisted planning again, stereolithographic modeling again, and then this one's different in that it has intraoperative navigation, and that's gonna help us with a complex facial reconstruction. So some important considerations when we do facial trauma the surgical correction of trauma injuries can, can be challenging. I mean, sometimes things just crush into a bunch of pieces. It's hard to piece them together. Uh, sometimes the anatomy is so far off, bone, soft tissue, things can be missing. So reconstructing that can, can present a lot of different challenges. Care has to be taken when designing our approaches to try to fix trauma, that we don't make scars worse, that we don't cut vital structures, nerves, arteries, veins, something like that. We don't wanna have new functional or sensory deficits on top of what the trauma uh, induced. Placement of the incisions should avoid or try to minimize unfavorable scarring. You know, it would be really easy to fix a cheekbone fracture by just putting a hole right there on the cheek, but I don't think people would say that's a better way to do it. It'd be easier, but that's not really the better way to do it. So we have to make sure we try to do favorably placed incisions. Surgeons uh, should try to preserve and reestablish the proper height, width, and then projection, anterior projection of the face that will try to yield the most functionally acceptable result. And then advances in technology have really allowed us to improve our outcomes and, and results. So here's the, the case description. We have a 26-year-old lady who was riding her bike. She was involved in a hit and run motor vehicle accident and that caused her to hit a tree. She sustained multiple complex fractures, some to the face, lots to the face, but also other orthopedic injuries. And she was initially admitted and treated at an outside hospital where she remained for, for over two months. She was unhappy with the results from the primary repair, and she felt that she just didn't look like herself anymore. And so this was her initial presentation uh, to us about five months after her primary repair at the other hospital. So on the CT, her this is the initial, not, not the treatment that we saw, but her initial from the, from the accident. So it's a bad one, but the initial injuries included a mandibular symphysis fracture. So this is an axial CT. So patients laying down flat on a table, and think of like we're sitting by or standing by her feet, looking up at the head. This is her right side. This is about where the chin would be. This is the left side. And so you can see the split almost right there in the middle. That's a symphysis fracture. She had bilateral zygomatical maxillary complex fractures. We just use ZMC for short. And then orbital floor fractures. So this is a coronal CT. So it'd be no different than looking at the patient taking slices, up and down slices from front to back. And then this is her right side, this is the left side. So everywhere the arrows are pointing are just some fractures. Her sinuses should be completely black and you can see there's some gray, but this one's completely full of gray. So there's fluid or blood or something that's in there, but all these bones shouldn't look like they're fragmented. That's all broken bones there. Bilateral mandibular condyle fractures. So the, the portion that we just rebuilt on the other patient with rib, she broke. Okay, so this, is, this should be a bone that's straight up and down. This piece should be sitting on top of here. This piece should be sitting on top of here. So she kind of broke both of those condyles. And then she had a Lafort one type maxillary fracture and split her palate right down the middle. So if we diagram about using graphic illustration of what her fractures were, just to understand it maybe a little better, this is what a mandibular symphysis fracture would look like. A Lafort one maxillary fracture would look something like this, just straight across the maxilla, almost like a, like a denture would be. Mandibular condyle fracture is this portion right here, the little hinge part of the, of the jaw. The image only shows the right side. I tried to find a bilateral one. I couldn't, I just said right, but she had bilateral. And then the ZMC fracture, is, it, it's, 
it's usually called a tripod, but there's four points of connection to it. And I thought this, this image really illustrated it nicely. There's, there's a connection here, one on the cheekbone, one on the upper jaw, and then one below the eye. And then a lot of times the floor of the orbit's also affected. And she had that on both sides. And then the reason that's significant is the ZMC or, the, or that buttress, that cheekbone, really is a sensitive indicator of cheekbone projection. And so that being, if it's not fixed properly, the face can widen out real quick. So five months after her primary repair, she, she showed this when she presented to us, uh, a pretty severely widened middle and lower face. And that was mainly due to malposition or malunion. Maybe the bones just healed in the wrong spot. And then significant asymmetry of her mid and lower face. She had a pretty bad malocclusion. When she bit her teeth together, that's all she got. Some people in the past have said, Doc, when I bite my teeth together and I eat a hot dog, all I get is the bun. So I, I love that. But she didn't say that, but that's sometimes what I love when, when patients will say that. It's cute. She did have a malocclusion, though. And then she, of course, fractured and lost a couple of teeth. So some eye findings, the orbital findings, they included a right-sided enophthalmus. And so if you stand either below or above the patient and you look at them, the right eye sunken in a little bit more. And it has to be sunken in a certain amount, two, three millimeters, before it becomes appreciably noticeable. Sometimes one or two millimeters maybe can, can be hidden from, from others noticing. Hers was a little bit more noticeable. I don't know if the photos necessarily demonstrated adequately, but you can see just the projection of the eyes maybe not the same as it is here. She also had vertical dystopia. So the right eye was lower than the left eye and there was mild lag ophthalmus. So you can see a little more white of the eye on the right side than there is on the left. And then the pupil position is just a little bit off. And so the floor fracture on the right side was, was probably a little bit off. These are just a couple other images just showing her from different views. Let's see. There we go. And then on presentation to clinic, this was her pano. We took a pano and a lateral ceph just as initial screening uh, x-rays. And on her pano, we noticed that the chin part was really wide. There didn't seem to be a lot of bone connection in that gap where she had that symphysis fracture. Her condyles weren't fixed. You can see where the arrows are showing. There's just a big bony gap. And those are hard to fix. Uh, not like we're pointing fingers at the surgeons who treated her, but they're hard to fix. But these weren't, they weren't uh, uh, attempted really. And then uh, that's about as much as we can gain on that x-ray. And then on this one, we can just show that she's got an open bite, but we can see that clinically as well. So what's our workup and plan for her? Well, medical CT, and we're going to go from the crown of the head all the way down to and including the mandible. We basically got to get that whole zone imaged. We're going to do another virtual surgical planning session with a biomedical engineer. This case, we're going to use with Stryker, and we're going to pre-perform pre the planned uh, surgery. We're gonna make custom cutting guides because it's been five months, bone has filled in those gaps where she had the fractures. And so we have to have custom cutting guides to help us decide how much do we cut off? Where should we make our cuts that aren't gonna hit vital structures and then knowing that we have to squeeze certain segments together. We have to fabricate a custom titanium reconstruction plate Another one that we don't want to necessarily bend in surgery, that'll just add a couple hours of time. So we're trying to cut time where we can. The final three-dimensional positions of various bony segments can be saved as individual files, and that can represent separate anatomic segments that can be seen and manipulated individually throughout this intraoperative navigation system. And that helps us guide and confirm osteotomies and repositioning segments. Here's what that means. I can take a CT or on the, on the virtual screen, I can make her right cheekbone red. I can make the left cheekbone blue. I can make the right side of the mandible yellow. I can make another color and I can play with them almost like they're Legos. I can move things in different positions. And then once I get it to where I think it should go, keep in mind, I've never seen her before. I've only seen the widened face version of her. We're guessing what it should look like based on the injury, based on just maybe her size, what her face should look like. So we're playing with positions. And then once we get them where we believe it looks good bony wise, we can save that as a data set and then use that data set once we get to surgery with our navigation system. And that's our new map. That's our new roadmap. That becomes almost real time guidance. So virtual surgical planning shows this. The preoperative position is everything that's shown in gray. And then where we wanna move her is in green. I use this as probably the best illustration of the change. Her jaw, lower jaw was this wide. This is as if we're a worm on the ground looking up at the patient's chin. So we call this a worm's eye view. This is her right side cheekbone sticking out here. This is the bottom part of the jaw that if you were to feel like the horseshoe shape of the bottom jaw, that's what this gray is here. So this is her right 
lower jaw coming across the chin, left lower jaw. And you can see where it needs to be is the green. So it's really narrowed. And then even the cheekbones, this is the right cheekbone. It had to move to here. Uh, left cheekbone had to move to here. So we know where we want to make changes. Now we have to figure out how we're going to do that surgically. It's really easy on a screen. It's actually really easy on a screen. It takes a few minutes. But then surgically, it's not, not quite as easy. The other thing that we notice is the palate got wide when we virtually put our teeth together and we see, okay, if we squeeze and narrow the mandible that much, her bite's going to be way off. What do we got to do in the maxilla? Well, we knew she had a Lafort 1 split palate, and that healed with about six millimeters of new bone that we had to then take out, which I can tell you surgically is not very easy. But we, we saw based on our measurements, and look how precise this is, 2.9 millimeters, 6.1 millimeters. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of detail that you can get on the virtual planning. I, I like the models. I like to see it in 3D. I mean, it's nice seeing it on a screen, but I, I like to have it in my hand. And so uh, we got models of what she looked like pre-op. So instead of having the gray and the green, we have clear and red. That, that's uh, the red coloring shows her current condition of the widened face and then the shortened facial height. And then the new models that we made are constructed using the plan changes. Remember all the different colors, we put them where we want them, print, right? That's kind of the way that that process works. That shows our plan changes. This is where she started. This is where we want to get her. And then we have to figure out how to get her there. So that allows for the creation of custom patient-specific implants. So plates, in this case, we're able to design a custom mandibular plate, a big one. You know, if we had to bend this thing in three dimensions around the curve, it would take probably two hours to get it there. And sometimes you don't get, at the end of that two hours, you don't get what you wanted. And so you maybe have to start over if it's that far off. So having a custom plate is just invaluable. We also had to make sure the custom plate fit after we did our removal or, or the reduction uh, using the cutting guide. And so that part was a little challenging uh, clinically, like once we got to surgery. The model also allowed us to make this, it was a stock orbital mesh, but we could then use the model to pre-bend what it should look like at the floor of the eye. The alternative that we would do without a model is we just keep trying it in. And every time you do that, it's like you're punching the eye in a sense. You got to keep dissecting underneath and you could get some inflammation. It just becomes a little bit harder to do clinically. So having the models, having the planning really cuts down and, and improves our accuracy. And then these are some splints because we were going to be changing the position of the lower jaw and the upper jaw, narrowing both. We wanted to make sure that once we got it close, if our splints fit, that that probably was the position that the teeth are in. And then I'll show you how we're able to confirm all that. So the navigation concepts, it uses the pre-op imaging to correlate clinical facial anatomy. So what does the patient look like on the operating room table? And then how do I register that with the CT scan anatomy that, uh, that we've already got or that we've already taken? The imaging or having the navigation allows us to really see these places that we otherwise couldn't see. So even if I've got a patient there for surgery and if I'm putting a mesh or something underneath the eye to fix the orbital floor, I still can't see the very back end of it. I can feel it. I can't see much more than maybe a centimeter or two of it. I, get, I need to go back maybe 30, 35 millimeters. So navigation is a little wand that allows us to, like a little probe, we can poke back there and look on a screen and see exactly where is my, my titanium mesh. So it allows us to see what we otherwise can't see. It helps us avoid anatomic structures, optic nerve. I mean, some of the big structures in the eye that we don't want to hit. And it provides a means to accurately evaluate the width and projection of facial units. And this is what I say with real-time guidance. Even once we have the face and the bones exposed, I can move things in three dimensions, but how do I know if I got it where I wanted it? And that's the challenge, right? If I, if I got a lot of broken pieces, how do I know when I'm putting it back together, did I get it exactly where I want it? And that's what the navigation really allows us to, uh, to do. So what's the process? Well, that CT that we took is uploaded to the navigation system and it's analyzed by the software. In the operating room, the patient's clinical anatomy, so the patient's now on the table, we have to register, we have to communicate what does the patient look like today with the CT scan data that we might've got a day or two prior. We use non-invasive methods and that it's like stickers for a face mask that we put on to, uh, to help communicate those things to each other. The accuracy of that registration is confirmed by placing this navigation wand, this probe, and I'll show you that in a moment, at, at different easily, easily visualized points to ensure accurate correlation to the CT imaging. And accuracy is so good, it's within one or two millimeters, which I can tell you, I don't think my eyes are, so I'm, I'm, we're happy to have navigation. And so the CT data being used must accurately represent any soft tissue swelling. 
And so we don't want to take a CT that we took when the patient came into the emergency room and then three or four months later use that same CT. Swelling is different. Facial aesthetics might be different. So it usually has to be within a day or so of the actual planned procedure. This is what that process looks like in the operating room. So we have a device that's this. It's, it's called the striker navigation system or cranial map. It's used a lot by neurosurgery. And so uh, they have this thing on the left called a cranial mask. This is here. This is the sticker. You just peel off the back of it. And it's got LED lights on it. This here is a little battery pack that provides just the power to that sticker, to that face mask. Similar, think of it like a navigation system in your car. There's got to be a map that's in there, right? So your, your screen, you just look at the screen. Oh, there's a map. Oh, that's, you know, that's where I live. So you got the screen uh, that's got your map. The equivalent of the map is going to be your CT scan data. Then there's a satellite that's got to track you, right? So when you're driving in your car, you got a map, and then you, there's a little cursor, of, this is my car on, on the map. Well, in that case, that's going to be the navigation camera. That's going to be this little arm here. And then there's something that communicates between the satellite and the map, and that's going to be the face mask. That's the communicator. Now, the catch, if you will, is that the camera has to be able to see the mask, otherwise it can't communicate. Well, as you'll see in a moment, that posed some challenges for us, and so we had to use kind of a plan B within the system. But the first step in the process is registration. We have to match the patient, what they look like in the operating room today to the CT scan data and see how closely uh, they match. This is the patient taken to the surgery. This is the cranial mask tracker, the big sticker. This is the battery pack. You can see the little tabs to pull off for the sticker. We apply the sticker to the patient's face and we do the registration. This is that navigation wand, so we can touch it to a point easily identifiable. Okay, I want to touch it to the cheekbone. I want to touch it to the angle. And what we'll do is we'll look at the screen at the, at the monitor. The monitor already has the CT scan data, but we're, we're registering the patient, what they look like today compared to what they look like on the CT. So all of the gray was the patient's pre-existing CT scan data. The colored portions are what we want the patient to look like. And then you can see this little blue on the screen that shows up as a little blue probe. And so that will tell us when, when the bone that we're moving is where we wanted to move it, a certain color will change. And you'll see that in a moment. So this is, it's called a coronal flap, but what we do is we essentially cut from the, from the top of the ear all the way across the top to the other ear and then peel the face down. And so to give orientation, this is the patient's left ear this is the top of the head. This is the frontal bone. This would be like the nasion here, the left orbital rim, superorbital rim, right or superorbital rim. And then the, the whole face is, is under here. Like this is the projection of the nose, just to give you some orientation. Well, I just mentioned that the sticker had to register what she looked like, but now we're blocking the sticker. So we had to use a different device. This one's called a, a, a tracker. And we screw that into the skull so it doesn't move, but it keeps that same data that the sticker registered. We just transfer it to this. So I don't know. I think of it like a thumb drive. We plug it into one device. Now we plug it into another. The data is still there, but it's just on a different device. So now it's, it's in the skull and it can't move. But that's important because we need that data. I need to know where when I move the bones, is it still in the right spot? So um, that's what this device is. Okay, so we got our flap designed and, and elevated up. We've got our bones exposed. And so the navigation system is used to verify the preoperative position after bony exposure and then throughout the case uh, to compare achieved bony reductions, meaning did we put them where we wanna put them with the virtual reconstruction that was planned. It's not as easy as, as uh, I didn't think it was gonna be easy and it certainly proved to not be easy. So following osteotomies or bone cuts and then repositioning in the areas of the right. This is the patient's right side, so the right ear. This is the right cheekbone. This is like the prominence of the cheekbone, the orbital rim, the supraorbital rim, and then the temporalis muscle just for orientation. So her nose would be underneath this part of it here and then the eyeball would be over here. And so we had to make a couple of cuts on those four points of connections of the zygoma and then rotate, pull out and then reposition it and then fix it in position with these new plates and screws. And then the same thing's done on the patient's left side. How do we know when we get it there? Well, this is where the navigation proved to be probably more instrumental than I really thought it would be. But I mean, I, I don't think I would do another case without it after, after doing uh, cases like these. So the images demonstrate the usage of the probe. Again, that's that blue 
portion here and then this part here on this side. And that helps us confirm. So if she started off where the gray is, and if I move things in and we're kind of looking at her face, looking at the screen, looking at her face. So once we move the arch or the zygoma of the bone in far enough to where it's now lined up with where we wanted it, the green segment, then we know we got it where we wanted it and we fixed that in position with plates and screws. Osteotomy of the mandible. Uh, remember we had to narrow the mandible quite a bit. So we cut about where her fracture was and she had about 10 millimeters of new bone. That's a centimeter. It's almost a finger of, of new bone that we had to just cut out and then re-narrow things. Well, muscles already attached in five, six months. So it's not as easy as it maybe sounds, although it does, I don't think it sounds easy, but we had to cut all that out. And then that's where the cutting guides were instrumental to tell us exactly where we make the cuts, how much we need to reduce and then a combination of pinching those bone segments together and then putting in our splints. Remember those custom splints we had? That's what you see here in between those teeth. So we have a combination of the mandible being cut along with the upper jaw being cut. So we just did a new Lafort one osteotomy, split the palate down the middle, remove that extra six millimeters of bone to narrow it, and then squeeze like the Dickens to get the patient to fit into those occlusal splints. Once we got her into the splint, we knew that we got about as much reduction as we needed uh, because it wasn't like it's under some spring-loaded tension. It was, it was at least a passive fit into the splints and then we were able to put plates and screws on. But pre-op planning also helped identify at the angles that we got her narrow the way that we wanted to. Narrowing somebody about a centimeter seems crazy and it, and it kind of is but we wouldn't have been able to fully know if we got the angle pushed in medially enough uh, unless we had the navigation. So it really was a very instrumental uh, technique. And then open reduction titanium uh, fixation of the bilateral subcondylar fracture. So remember those, the hinge portion of the jaw joint. So here's the right side. This is like her right ear lobe, maybe down here the right temporalis muscle, then the cheekbone, the photo's a little bit tilted. This is the right cheekbone, and then the condyle is just below that. So we had to open that up. The facial nerve is, is always at risk on those. Thankfully, uh, we identify those and just pull it out of the way, but then put on new plates and screws. And then the same thing on the left side. So post-op images, after everything's done, we get CT just to, to show what we got right away afterwards. So this is a, pretty much an immediate post-op within the first 24, 48 hours. These are just three-dimensional reconstructions. And so it seems to show improved facial symmetry. She does have a narrower face uh, in, the, in the cheekbone area. So she's not as wide as it was before. And then same thing in the mandible. It's a little bit narrower. Uh, and then restoration of what appears to be an appropriate orbital bony volume compared to her pre-op. This is that same worm's eye view that, that we looked at a little bit earlier, just looking for symmetry, things that are asymmetric kind of stick out. These are just oblique views, and so they demonstrate improved and symmetric facial projection in the ZMC areas, as well as a properly reduced condyle that's now in the fossa. And so that's restored the the posterior vertical facial height. And so that's this area here. It's tough to tell on a three-dimensional X-ray. We saw it clinically, but you can kind of see at least the, the condyles are now in their fossa. Remember they were tipped off and, and they were medially displaced. And then these are the images of the patient post-op. And so this is about a three month, yeah, three month post-op. And so she's undergoing ortho treatment. We got a lot of the arch bars and everything off that we had to get off. And so she wanted to just tight, tidy some things up with the teeth. I couldn't blame her. And so we, we were able to get things close, but she wanted things perfect, you know, the little tooth out of position. So we got those things corrected with ortho. And then we still have a little bit of work to do to get bone grafting, a little more bone grafting done in the symphysis to be able to put an implant to replace the missing teeth. That's all I've got. Thank you, Dr. Elo, for your wonderful presentation and very detailed. Definitely would want to see you if I had that need, because um, that was a pretty interesting um, journey that you shared with us. So we want to take some time, number one, uh, to take any questions. So I don't know if there's questions on the Zoom or any questions in the audience. We'll take a few minutes to, to go ahead and ask some questions. If anybody has any, we'll get a microphone around. I think there's one in the back back there. If you want to speak up, we'll try and... How 
How many surgeries do you do in a year? Like these, I think it's, it's, uh, that's a tough one to say how many in a year because cases take principles from each other. So ones that are exactly like this, not more than one or two in a year, but you might have Orbit or ZMC. You might have dozens of those. You might have dozens of mandibles. You might have dozens of upper jaw, but when you put all of them together, we usually get them at the beginning. And so the re the redo of them is a little bit less common because we usually are on the front line, like, you know, getting them for the primary repair. So those, those you can get dozens of those, but the reconstruction ones are a little bit less common unless it's isolated to an orbit because sometimes the eye fractures are the ones that have a, a tendency to have to get revised. Any other questions? Okay, run right here. So a lot of times the, the limiting factor uh, on the turnaround might be the fabrication of the plate, probably two weeks, yeah, not too much time. From the pre-planning, so for those on Zoom, the pre-planning to the actual surgery is about two weeks. Another question right here. That's a great question. Uh, the question just for those on Zoom was uh, how much physical therapy did the patient with the ameloblastoma resection have to undergo and what, what about her opening? So the reality is patients can actually articulate even on one good joint. Now we gave her a functional joint, meaning there is cartilage against cartilage. So those two will never ankylose. You know, if you have bone on bone, that has a risk of ankylosis. So it actually becomes a functioning joint within a month. I mean, she's, she's really articulating probably primarily on the other side and then maybe less so on that side. And you can see how skinny that bone is, but it's reinforced in, in a sense with, uh, with the uh, plate and then the rib, but she can function on it no different than anybody else. Now, the, the, maybe the good part is when someone's got a partial or a denture or something like that, sometimes their chewing force is far reduced versus someone who's fully uh, with teeth, but they function, I mean, really from day one, we don't have them wired shut or anything because her, she's fixed in position. And so, yeah, they can actually get started right away. Now, just the way that the process goes, they get swollen big afterwards, right? You strip off all that muscle, the muscle just balloons up. So that has to go down. And sometimes it's the muscle that takes a little bit more time to work its way out. The bony part is really not going to change, but the muscle part might take a few weeks of just real sore muscle that has to go away. So we get physical therapy involved right away. There's a thing called a therabyte. It looks like a little, it's like a little device. You squeeze a handle and it props your mouth open. So we get them on the therabyte right away. That way they can start functioning. You know, there's the, there's the physical part of surgery, then there's the psychological part of surgery. If I do surgery on your jaw, you're gonna wanna not talk. You're gonna wanna keep your face like, that, right? Because there's the psychological part, like, oh, everything's broken, I don't wanna screw it up. But when there's fixed with plates and screws, you can, but there's the psychological part where you might not until you see the swelling down, the pain's gone, now you feel ready to, to do something, yeah. But it, that process takes about a month, maybe. Yeah. All right, any other questions? One more up here. You said dental? Dental specialty. Dental specialty. Um, I don't know. Who wants to answer that here? Who is here with me? <laughs> I think specialty-wise, I don't know. I mean, I we work... We I, Actually, probably the pathologist. I think like Dr. Andrews said, probably the pathologist for me. Now, I think we also work pretty heavily with, with the general dentist. We work with pros and... But I mean, we kind of work with everybody. I would say the... Probably pathology, though. Yeah, I think that's right. That's probably the one that I do the most. Any other questions? Any questions on the Zoom? Don't see anything there. So I think we're good there. So we wanna thank uh, Dr. Elo again for your presentation. And we also wanna again thank this, we wanna thank the Sarkarias for being here today and for helping us have these awesome lectures.
And then also for giving us that opportunity to have the endowed professorship, because that is really going to give us other opportunities in our college and in our community to impact our patients. So we really do appreciate that. So thank you all again for attending tonight. Um, we appreciate your time and your attention. And Dr. Elo will be here for a few minutes if you want to come up and ask another question. So thank you very much.